VC election is only three weeks away and uh, climate and energy have now kind of officially entered the campaign and been a flurry of press releases over the last day or two, including some from the BC Liberal Party, uh, uh, criticizing uh, the BC NDP on climate, particularly around clean BC. So we're gonna talk to that, talk about that with Peter uh, Millibar. Uh, and uh, welcome to the interview, meet Peter. Great, thanks for having me on. Well, why don't we start with you uh, explaining an argument that you've made in the press release which is that essentially clean BC is nothing more than a rehashed version of the liberal climate strategy. Well, thanks for that. And, and yeah, absolutely it is. Um, you know, this is something I've been pressing in, in the legislature um, all the way along. Uh, there's lots of Hansard debate and record of the conversation back and, and forth with then Minister Heyman and myself at the time, I was the environment critic. And, and really, um, when you look at Clean BC, the, the targets and the ends uh, and, and the check-in waypoints of where we should be with emission reductions are the exact same timeline uh, and the exact same reduction targets as what was introduced by the BC Liberals back in 2007. And so this was updated with some more modern, obviously, timelines because uh, back in 2007, they weren't worrying about coming up with a 2030 check-in date. Um, so that makes sense, but that date and, and those, those uh, matrix of, of uh, tangible deliverables uh, are the exact same. Then you look at a clean BC plan and you say, okay, wait a second. Uh, it was announced almost two years ago now. It was announced at the time, missing 25% of the overall emission profile uh, target reductions that they needed to have. Uh, the minister said at the time and acknowledged it was missing, had said it would be about a year and they would be presented uh, to the public. Uh, here we are almost two years later. They're not. Uh, emissions have risen every year in British Columbia uh, that the NDP have been in office. And in fact, when I pointed out on the very first year uh, that uh, the finance minister had actually budgeted uh, and they needed emissions to rise uh, to be able to make their budget stay in surplus. So when you look at the overall carbon taxes collected in British Columbia, yes, the dollar figure increases because we are stepping carbon tax up $5 a ton while the NDP were in power here. Uh, but they've actually, if you do the backward division calculation of what a, a per ton for that year is costing, they actually expected emissions and budgeted and needed emissions to rise from 41.6 megatons uh, back when we changed uh, power uh, to 44 megatons uh, in year three of the NDP. And so, uh, fiscally, they actually do need that. It, was a, it would create about a six to $800 million hole in their budget um, if, in fact, uh, emissions did not rise in British Columbia. So there's all sorts of holes in Clean BC, and, and that is why we're saying it's, it's a great marketing document. It has not delivered uh, anything to the British Columbia public. Let's talk about delivering GHG emission reduction, because part of Clean BC, the strategy, is the electrification of buildings, industry, transport, to get those, uh, or if they're not electricity, then hydrogen. And in order to do that, depending on the study uh, that you read, uh, it could be as much as 50% more power needed in BC by 2030. And yet at the same time, the, the Horgan government uh, has kind of gone after the independent power producers, the, the private sector power producers, and it's really hard to see how they're going to get from here to 2030 without private capital uh, building wind and solar. Well, and that's one of the big problems for British Columbia to bring down their emission profile is that we already have a very clean source of electrification uh, process in British Columbia with hydropower uh, compared to the rest of the world that are trying to get themselves off of coal and other types of, of energy uh, production. And so well, the great irony of this is we're in the middle of this unnecessary election because the BC Liberal Party, the Green Party, um, Indigenous communities uh, did not agree with Bill 17, which would have actually saw us no longer required to be self-sufficient within our own province for energy, uh, electricity, as well as it would have allowed for a, a massive increase of importation of brown power out of the United States to supplement our needs to electrify the province. We would have actually been taking yet another step backwards uh, with that bill. Instead, uh, we need to see those, those independent power production uh, continue on 
It's great for Indigenous communities as an economic development uh, model. And, and the NDP have triggered this whole election based on, on the fact they want to bring in brown power from the United States. Well, I want to push back on you a little bit there because my understanding is that the, all the imported power is going to have, to have a clean certificate to get around to avoid exactly what you're talking about, and I know there's been some some debate about uh, the fine print in in what they want to do that would allow them still to bring in brown power. But what then? About, what's your response then to the clean energy certificate that the NDP had proposed? Well, if you look at it, they wouldn't even define in the bill what what classified as clean energy. Um, there's only a certain types of energy we all know that can be produced on mass that you would want to import and put onto a grid and bring into British Columbia. The fact they wouldn't even define and we're going to leave that for regulation after the bill had already been passed uh, should put up uh, red flags everywhere for people. Uh, the fact they said it would be no problem relying on California for power and three days after the bill was pulled from the legislative calendar, uh, California started to experience brownouts uh, would indicate that if we get rid of our self-sufficiency, we're in big trouble as California goes through the ebbs and flows of their own power grid issues uh, between fires and, and consumption and everything else. Um, and so the fact that the NDP were trying to push this through uh, is troubling. And, and there is no true certification process at this point. Um, you know, once it's in the grid, um, everyone acknowledges once it's in the grid, it's almost impossible to trace where it came from. So the reality is we would have been importing brown power uh, from the United States. We would have uh, severely restricted our ability to produce our own green energy, uh, be it through independent means or be it through BC Hydro. And uh, the reality is that was one of the bills uh, that the Premier decided to break his confidence and supply agreement with the Green Party and trigger this unnecessary election a year ahead of time because he didn't get his way of, of making us even uh, uh, our energy supply brown, essentially. Last question, Peter. And um, I, today the, uh, the BC NDP team put out a press release where the uh, Horgan promised to legislate net zero emissions by 2050. That seems to be uh, the target that everybody's aiming for, including the federal government. Uh, does, where does the Liberal Party stand on that? Well, let, let's be realistic here. It, it's a laudable goal, uh, but everything so far with Clean BC uh, that this uh, NDP government had brought forward, um, and I've pointed this out and it's all over answered as well, um, every check-in point, every reference point, everything that they have done that they said would be measurable under Clean BC, miraculously was going to happen after the next scheduled general election. Um, and so the fact that we are now having an election even a year faster than that, uh, just goes to show you how they are not prepared to be held accountable for anything that they've actually said they're delivered to the environment, uh, to the energy plan. Of course, I think everyone recognizes that we're going to be phasing off of fossil fuels as a society as, as we keep moving forward to that March of 2050. Of course, new uh, technologies need to be encouraged. Um, it's, it simply does not reconcile itself though that you're trying to uh, create legislation that would basically ban uh, the ability for these uh, type of green and new energy sources to come online and be part of our grid um, and encourage it that way. Uh, when you're actually opening the door for a glut of uh, brown power at low rates to come in from the United States. Um, there too are working at total counter, uh, counter purposes. Um, and we haven't even touched on the fact that they haven't properly accounted for LNG uh, first phase, let alone the second phase that they're legally entitled and permitted uh, to initiate as well as an LNG project. So before I let you go, Peter, yes or no, the, the DC Liberal Party uh, stand for net zero emissions by 2050? I think what you're going to see in our platform, and obviously we're talking right now uh, ahead of when our platform will be released on the environment, and that should come out in the next few days. Uh, so I don't want to divulge too much. That's not usually a good way to get yourself in good stead with your leader. Uh, but certainly what you're going to see is real, tangible, measurable results. We want deliverables. I think everybody is sick and tired of, of political parties and elected leaders. Uh, talking a good game and setting goals so far off uh, that they will long be out of office uh, before they ever get measured on whether or not it was a success or not. I want to see uh, real tangible results. I want to see deliverables that we can be held to. I think that's what the public will see and should expect. And, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, I think everyone agrees uh, that an end goal is try to drive carbon to the absolute lowest it possibly can be. Ultimately, what that's going to look like in 2050 
uh, when it's 2020 right now is going to be a little bit different. But I, I dare say I, I would be shocked if myself or, or uh, John Horgan are still in elected office 30 years from now. So how will we judge John Horgan about what he has been doing or what he's going to do over the next 12 months? Uh, this is a climate emergency that we cannot wait the 30 years to say, well, maybe he was right or maybe he was wrong. Um, and so that's what you'll see in our platform it is very much deliverable, real, tangible things uh, that will make an actual measurable difference uh, to our environment. Great. Thank you very much. And, and I know, Peter, before the end of the election, we will have you back because I expect this to be a fairly hot topic on the campaign trail. Great. Thank you. Anytime.